right. <clears throat> Rene Descartes said, I think, therefore I am. But if he had been here today in the digital world that we live in, I think this is what he would have said. I think, <laughs> therefore I am. What does that mean? That means we create content, we tweet, we're on Facebook, we post blogs. People take pictures of us. You could say my grandma's not in Facebook. She may be. Right? There's 25 million people whose pictures are on Facebook, and they didn't take them. Right? So what I want to talk to you today is the idea of hacking happiness, how we can give big data and our little data a direction. Because right now, happiness in the Internet economy, there's a couple things about it. Right? First of all, we want to tweet all the time. i got to tweet. i got to tweet. Right? It's a sense of sort of increased productivity. The more data that I create about myself, in one sense, the happier I'll be. And also this, the idea in the internet economy right now that people can sell our data and we don't really understand who's selling it and why. So I want to show you how I think we can solve that problem. So I'm going to talk about three technologies, three keys to hacking happiness. By the way, when I say hacking, I don't mean the mean kind. I mean re-envisioning like we talked about, other speakers have talked about today, rethinking uh, something you thought of before. So the quantified self movement. Anybody here quantified self? Heard of it? Yes? Okay. Um, one thing about the quantified self movement that people don't always think about is, yes, you might be using an app like a Fitbit or a jawbone up, and you may be using something like a pencil or a pen even to record the data about your life. But one aspect of this technology called quantified self that I think is most compelling is the logic. The main part about it, one of the reasons it's so hard, is that you need to reflect. The real power comes from quantified self when you see the data you see the patterns about your life in that data, and then you optimize that data. So this app that you're looking at is called Cardio, created by a guy at MIT. It's pretty simple. Download it, point it at your face, and it can tell by the changing tone of your skin color when there's more blood in your face what your heart rate is. Point it at your face tells your heart rate. So I am happily married now, but I've been talking about this app a lot recently, and, and I wish I had this app when I was still dating, because I would have gone on a date, and halfway through, I would have excused myself, right? And I would have gone to the bathroom. I would have looked at the app, and I would have said, you know, kind of like a magic eight ball, hey, hey, cardio app, does this woman make my heart skip a beat? <laughs> and, and I would have done it because I'm a huge, big old geek. I would have done it. And by the way, I have a friend who's created an app that can email someone six hours before they have a heart attack in terms of heart type stuff. And uh, I always wonder, that's got to be a tough email to send. <laughs> Dear Bob, hope you're not doing anything this afternoon. <laughs> so the second technology, the second way I want to talk about hacking happiness, is a technology called the Internet of Things. Some people call it smarter cities, smarter schools, smarter buildings. But basically what it means is the sensors that are in our smartphones, like with Quantified Self, a lot of those apps, can also be in the world around us. And they can give more information about our data, our little data, our personal data, the personal data economy is what I call it. And this, what it is, is there's a student from MIT who took an accelerometer sensor 
And all that is, you have it in your smartphone, is, is the sensor knows when your phone moves up and down or around. It's also used for GPS, so it knows when you're turning. So he took the accelerometer sensor, and because he was worried about drinking and driving, he put it inside an ice cube. And now when he drinks, he goes to parties, puts the ice cube in a glass, and as he takes drinks, the ice cube changes color, green to yellow to red. And when it's red, he's drunk. <laughs> <laughs> now, why this is the second aspect of happiness is we're in a world where we want to build influence in the social media realm. I've been in social media since 2005. I used to check my clout score, I kid you not, every hour. If you're not familiar with clout, it's a way that you can see online. Basically, are the words that I'm saying is the stuff that's reflected about me and my identity in this personal data economy resonating. Can I increase my influence? And there's nothing wrong with that. But now in this new environment, I want you to picture if I'm at a bar pointing my video camera at you, and you're next to Ice Cube Boy, right? And he's drinking, and the Ice Cube goes from yellow to red. And he takes out his keys, and he says, screw it, it's a dumb idea. <laughs> and he starts to walk off, and I'm still filming you, and you laugh at him, and then you walk off. Guess what? I'm wondering about you. Why didn't you help him? And that speaks to accountability, and that speaks to the fact that although our words are important, our actions are even more important, and altruism, being compassionate for others, that's the second huge part of hacking happiness. So the last technology I'm going to talk about is called augmented reality. I've been studying it for years. I write for a publication called Mashable. I've written a couple of books. And this technology just fascinates me. It's magical to me. And basically, you hold up a smartphone. You look through your phone as if you're going to take a picture with your camera. And then depending on what you're pointing your phone at, digital data is overlaid your screen. And I want to be clear. What that means is these tools whether it's Google Glass or a different technology, or most geeks like me think it's gonna be a contact lens. When you're wearing a computer that's a contact lens over your eye, that lens quite literally will be how you see, perceive, and judge the world. So, up until about two years ago, I was really freaked out about this, right? I write about technology, I love technology, and technology is not inherently good or evil, it just is. I have a stick, I can burn it to warm all of you, or I can beat you with it, <laughs> right? However, what you're looking at is kind of where we are right now in the internet economy, because we're giving away our data for free. This precious information about the core of our identity we go to a website, and I'm the same, I'm cavalier, it's irritating, terms and conditions, 14 pages, whatever, right? But I, I'm evangelistic about this, I need people to understand how important their data is. So, this, you got to watch this movie, go to Google and Google the word sight and augmented reality, you'll watch this six minute film, it's from the perspective of a guy looking, in this case he's looking at this woman, he's on a date. And he's using all these technologies that I've talked about, quantified self, etc. He's measuring things like when her pupils dilate, which is an indicator, a proxy that correlates for positive emotion. It's a science called effective computing, which I love. He's looking at things like her skin tone, like I just mentioned, to see when is her blood alcohol content level at the point where I can get her in the sack. And when you don't understand about your data, when you don't understand what's being projected about you, you and we are in this scenario. And this is something we have to hack. So two years ago, someone introduced me to this speech by Robert Kennedy called the Beyond GDP speech. I'm not an economist. I could have cared less about the gross domestic product up until two years ago when I heard this speech, and what Kennedy talks about is the fact that this primary measure of value, the data, the only, as far as I know, the only point of data regarding value and wealth and currency 
that the entire world has agreed upon for 70 years is the GDP. And I want to be clear, the GDP is a philosophy as much as it is a metric. And what Kennedy pointed out is he said, look at what the GDP measures. It measures things like increase of goods, fiscal wealth, all things that make sense. But it also measures productivity. The more you produce in one sense, right, the happier you'll be. That's the message. But what Kennedy pointed out is there's also things the GDP doesn't measure, like the quality of education, the environment, or art. So in terms of hacking happiness, the good news is that Kennedy inspired something called these happiness indicator metrics. And around the world, the name is somewhat of a misnomer. It's not happiness, it's what this term positive psychology calls hedonic or fleeting happiness, which is totally normal, but you know, it's the thing of, I got a new iPhone, and two days later, someone else has the newer iPhone, and you're like, I suck, right? (laughs) That happiness is fleeting. This is about long-term intrinsic well-being. Intrinsic well-being happens when you're with family, you're with community, you help others, you savor, you reflect. And these are the types of measures now around the world being measured not just in the United States, but in Brazil, China, Australia, all around the world. The United Nations had their second world annual happiness report this year, reporting on all these different metrics. Yes, money is a part of it, but also things like access to education, access to art, all these things which can measure if people are flourishing. That's the term flourishing, then the the specific happiness is up to you. So what does that mean in closing? It means that now people are measuring their little data using quantified self. And if we can allow ourselves, they're pausing and taking the time to reflect. And guess what? Passive data, quantified self collects this stuff without you needing to look at it. We get to put the phones away. Secondly, the sensors, like those ice cubes, we now have a way to be more focused on others. And altruism and compassion can start to be the metric with which we think of how do I actually have influence in my life and my community. And now countries are saying, yeah, let's match this data. And we'll get to see how you feel and we get to see how what we do, how that makes you feel. And not just feel, but how we can actually improve things. And that means we can give big data a direction and we can switch the focus on productivity and profit to purpose and hack happiness. Thank you.